If you remember last year, we had the bureau chief from the New York Times, uh, Keith Bradshaw, talking about the new government in China. This year, we've got an equally eminent speaker, Amy Windholt, managing director of APCO. Amy is a very interesting character, very interesting indeed. Back in 2004, Amy went to Beijing. She went to the Beijing Administrative University to teach officials from the Chinese Communist Party, having worked for the US government for a number of years. I had a chat with, uh, with, with Amy just now. She assured me, ladies and gentlemen, that she's not a member of the NSA. She is not a US spy. I don't think there's any listening devices in this room, Amy. Thank you. But Amy is going to share her insights, and I think her unique insights, into the challenges and change one year of the new leadership in China. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm French chamber welcome, Amy Weindhoek. Yes, I, 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 can also, um, I can also reassure you I'm not a Communist Party member, so um, really thrilled to be here today to talk with you all. And we're going to have just a short 15 minutes to kind of look at what's been going on over the last year with um, China's leadership now in place. So as I'm sure you know, November of last year was when the new leadership was officially named. So Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang um, received their party designations. And then they became, they, they achieved all three party um, leaderships uh, with their party, their government, and military um, titles being passed on last March during the MPC. And I think it's really lovely timing to be here today, having just wrapped up the 2014 MPC. So a few more touch points for us to um, look at and think upon. So when, when I was asked to kind of look back one year in to evaluate China's leadership, I really thought that we should ask three questions, right? So to evaluate the current leadership, I really wanted to know, has the new leadership really accurately diagnosed the challenges, you know, economic and social, that are facing the country? And then secondly, if they have accurately diagnosed those, have they put in place or have they developed the right solutions to address those challenges? And third, per but perhaps most importantly, do we believe that they have the power and the capability, perhaps more accurately, political muscle, to, accu to, to actually um, put these reforms into place? So that's what I thought I'd just take a few moments here today to really walk through those three questions, kind of my analysis here, and um, I, I know there's a lot of uh, China China specialists here, so I, I hope we'll, you'll agree with my thoughts. So in terms of diagnosis, you know, um, unfortunately, uh, Xi Jinping has never come out and said, these are the four challenges. You know, so these, these ideas are really drawn from his statements, um, the issues that he's uh, tackled, and the, and the way that they've moved on um, in the first year. So I think he has diagnosed really four kind of mega, ch mega challenges. The first, and this one is kind of a legacy from the um, uh, Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao legacy, uh, leadership, which is this need for a consumption-led economy. So that was, I think, accurately diagnosed by Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao. There's been a lot of research and reports on this. The good news is um, Xi Jinping, the new leadership, Xi Jinping, Li Keqiang, they have adopted this, they've embraced this, they signed off on the 12 five-year plan. So this is kind of one of the pillars of reform or challenges that China faces that they agree with. I think the second piece, this lack of competitive markets, this is new. Um, and I think it really does reflect kind of the priorities of this administration. It was really a signature pillar of the plenum, which happened last November. And as we, as we saw the phrase, right, that they wanted markets to play a more decisive role in the economy. So there's been a lot of action around this piece. I think the third piece um, is also a reflection on Xi Jinping's reflection on the uh, Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao leadership. 
they really, they had strong ideas, they had policies, but they didn't have the leadership or the power to really implement. So I think that a lot of the activities that you've seen Xi Jinping do is around ensuring they have the decision-making power, the implementation power to really move their policies forward. And, third, and fourth, but not last, these endemic weaknesses. I'm kind of grouping under this what, um, what I would basically put pollution and corruption, right? Um, the systems that China has, the, they create certain problems, right? Their incredible growth rate and the political system they have. So he's, he's diagnosed these systems and he's going to address them. So these were his, what I would, what I would uh, say were the um, challenges that he has most identified. And then I, I would say that there were reforms needed. He's really come out with a lot of, um, you know, with a strong agenda. And I think we can first look at the plenum, which, uh, which happened last November. And, you know, I would look at the, the leadership that came out of that was really a mission or a vision statement and a to-do list. And kind of stemming from that, the, these, are, these are the reforms that he's outlined. And I've grouped them into four sectors. Um, first is the financial sector. There's been a lot of movement here, right? A lot of reform efforts. So recently, we just saw that they're going to allow private banks to be operating in China. This is exciting. These are all going to be domestic banks, but certainly development in the right, right direction. They're removing limits on banking reform. They're really interest rate liberalization. A lot, a lot is happening here, and I think that most of these reforms will likely um, first be piloted or tested in the Shanghai Free Trade Zone. Um, very typically, things that are successful will then be um, you know, piloted in other locations and then hopefully spread throughout the country. So lots of activity happening there. The fiscal policy, I think this relates um, to what Ben was previously talking about, right? There is real recognition of the, of, the, of the challenges that the country is going to face with the local debt issues um, and just ensuring that they can continue to invest and grow. So we saw a lot of reforms going on here. This is actually my background. I used to do um, budgetary policy for the U.S. government. So um, I love this stuff. But, um, you know, China's budgetary systems are incredibly untransparent. I mean, when you look at the rankings globally, um, you know, it's Zimbabwe and China. Um, and there's real efforts to change that because there's real risks by having that lack of transparency. So we've had new statements requiring all local and federal government departments and bureaus to release their budgeting. Um, and and that's, that's really exciting. Um, and a lot of this is to address that shadow banking that's been going on and to really get an understanding of the accounts that are happening. I think it's mostly focused on trying to really limit the expenditures that are going on. But also, you see this tax, this focus on tax breaks, um, you know, to really make sure that what lo the, the, the ways that the local government can gather money are appropriate, right? So it's not just through the sale of of, of real estate, but that they have um, real estate tax and property tax, environmental taxes, all sorts of things in place. So uh, exciting development, a, a kind of a key reform that we'll see. SOE reform, you know, during the plenum, there was a lot of speculation. Would, they, would the new administration address SOE reform? I was really excited to see that they, that they did. Um, but I think that excitement we need to kind of, there's a little realism we need to have there. Um, you know, his, his ideas on SOE reform, excuse me, the administration, so Xi Jinping, Li Keqiang, and the administration's ideas on SOE reform, state-owned enterprise reform, are not to open these up, right? They are still gonna be a central part of China's economy. But really, it's to kind of restructure them. It's to put um, intent, more scrutiny to them, make them more competitive, have market forces at play. So we will be opening up the sector to competition, but this is not to say that we're going to see SOEs disbanded. Um, it's really that we're going to see SOEs probably acquiring um, other SOEs and hopefully becoming more efficient. And maybe last um, but not least, and I think this is maybe really exciting for foreign um, multinational companies, 
is this emphasis on um, reforming the market entry procedures. So there's been a lot of statements about making this easier um, and more accessible. So maybe um, the top bullet is about Lee Keqiang, right? He said that there's something like 1,700 um, administration approval, uh, uh, administrative rules. He wanted to eliminate a third of them. And I think the recent count was that more than 400 have actually been eliminated. He plans to eliminate another 200 in the, in the months ahead. So this is to make the administrative process of establishing a company a lot more, a lot easier. But in addition to the administrative processes, they're actually lowering barriers to entry. So capital requirements, things of this nature, um, will be uh, reduced so that to, to make it easier for companies to come in. And not just foreign, right, domestic as well, but it's really to improve those processes. Um, and, and again, in the Shanghai Free Trade Zone was a nice pilot for this. There was a shift um, in, in from a, a positive list to a negative list. And, um, and what that means is that previously there was a list of all of the um, sectors where you were allowed to operate. And now they've shifted that to be, okay, everything is allowed, but now except these sectors are not allowed. Now there's been criticism because they're essentially mirror images of each other. <laughs> um, but the mindset is actually an important shift, which is now aligned with the global mindset that said, everything is allowed except for these spaces. Whereas the previous mindset was saying, nothing is allowed except for these. So, um, so hopefully we'll start to see items removed um, from the disallowed list, but, um, but it's, it, is a, it is a shift and a realignment with um, global best practice. So these are the areas, these kind of four areas that I believe the current administration has been focusing on. Um, so then that begs the question of, well, can they do it? And I think overwhelmingly people feel pretty confident that this administration has the power and the leadership and the, the will to really implement the reforms that they have outlined. Um, I kind of highlight here some of the ways that the current administration has been able to really consolidate power. I think um, most prominently we went from a nine-person Politburo to a seven-person Politburo, making it easier to get consensus, right? Limiting the number of decision makers involved. We also see the three leadership positions. So this refers to the fact that very quickly, right, within his first year, the, um, Xi Jinping was able to achieve the party designation, the government designation, and the military designation. It took Hu Jintao much longer to do that, demonstrating that he has the support needed. Um, the leading groups, I think we're all familiar with these um, very fun, these long named leading groups, but there's really three that have come out um, around national security, most recently on cybersecurity and then um, reform generally. And you know, Xi Jinping is the head of all of them, right? So basically he's creating these new structures with himself at the helm that's saying, I'm gonna drive this forward. Um, the anti-corruption campaign has made a lot of headlines with senior officials from SASEC as well as um, CNPC. Very, very senior officials, right? Former um, working group member. Um, if these guys, if he can get to these guys, he's got, he's got power, right? Um, the, the other issues, I think, also, he's been pulling lots of levers. Um, the nationalism play to say that he can really drive decisions, um, populism. Uh, he's been very involved. The third plenum, the reports are that he directly wrote the third plenum. There's rumors that he wrote the, working, the work report from this most recent um, NPC. So we're talking about a really hands-on leader who kind of has um, really been driving this forward. So, you know, if when we look back at those three questions, you know, has he accurately diagnosed the challenges? I think, um, you know, I think a lot of people say that yes, a lot of what he has diagnosed is accurate. Um, when we look at has he developed reforms that are appropriate, um, I think the answer is a little more mixed on that, um, in that a lot of these reforms are very positive. But um, actually, there's a report out today that makes this parallel. I think it's lovely that Xi Jinping does not want to be the Gorbachev 
of China, right? So in other words, he doesn't want to start some reforms that kind of let the floodgates open. So instead, we've seen him very focused on reforms in certain sectors, in certain economic areas. But we've seen a real crackdown on a lot of social issues. So it's not that he's just opening doors. He's opening very, very specific doors. And he is controlling which of those doors are open. So I think there's a little bit more mixed judgment around um, are the reforms that he's selecting the right ones. But I think there's pretty general consensus that um, he can do it, right? That, th that what he wants to do, he's going to do. Um, which I think leads to my, my last slide, which is about kind of what's this, um, what's going to happen, right? Now that we've kind of had one year, what can we expect in the year ahead? And, you know, I may be the only person in the world that will link Xi Jinping to Elvis. But if I, um, <laughs> if I were going to say kind of the mindset of Xi Jinping right now, I would quote the Elvis song, right? A little less conversation, a little more action. Um, I think that we've seen the last year is setting all the groundwork. He's defined his agenda. He's detailed his reforms. He has his to-do list, and he's got the power to put it in place. So we're going to have a really exciting year. I think um, Ben was saying there's a lot of this is an exciting place. Um, not all of these changes are going to be good, but I think they're certainly not going to be easy. Um, there are opportunities, right? We're going to have incre easier market entry for comp companies, both domestic and foreign, um, easier administrative processes. This, so hopefully creating a business is going to be smoother, including new um, opportunities, right? Opening up previously restricted sectors. But the challenges, there's going to be some big challenges here. Um, I think we're going to see ongoing policy change. It's going to be hard to stay current on what the new initiatives are and how they're going to impact you. So I think it's going to be a very dynamic year. I think the anti-corruption campaign is going to continue. And foreign multinational companies are easy targets, right? They're not the only targets, but they are often easy. So I think it's, really, it's going to be really important to have a robust understanding of what's happening in your firm and the, and the potential threats that you face. Um, the antitrust enforcement, I would say th there's been an ongoing effort over the last year, and I think it's been, you know, maybe um, disproportionately affecting foreign multinational sectors, or, or sec uh, foreign multinational companies, or in sectors where foreign multinational companies are dominating. So I think we can see more of, more of that coming up. Nationalism is always a challenge, I think, when you're operating, when you're a foreign company operating there. I think you're going to see much more of that in China. And, you know, the ideal is that the state sector, with these reforms that are in place, will be re-energized, will, you know, will be more competitive. So you could be facing a more dynamic um, uh, competitive landscape there. So these were uh, my, uh, my thoughts on the uh, new administration. And um, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. That was excellent.